Hello everybody, this is Yaakov Fein. I have presented this talk, Becoming a Professional Software Developer, several times I've been uh, attending and participating in a conference in India. It was a great uh, developers conference like three years ago. Just came back from Ukraine, it's May of 2012, where I presented this talk to more than 400 people. And uh, I thought that it will be might be interesting and definitely thought-provoking for people who speak English and uh, didn't have a chance to attend one of these talks. And a warning, I realize that many of you may not agree with what I say, right? And you can say that in your country this is not applicable. But my goal is to help you understand the rules of the game, which is called... Uh, working in IT or maybe making a professional career in IT in information technologies and I think that these rules are applicable to most of the cases regardless of your geographical locations. The thing is that what you're about to hear is most likely known to you but usually people don't talk about these things in a methodical manner so to speak. Maybe you won't, you won't agree with my statement that, I, that I'm about to make, but still, let's see. I work for a company called Farata Systems. Uh, we are in the business of developing enterprise applications of different kind, mainly web application. It could be a rich internet application, it could be a thin client, but this is how we make money. My role in here is uh, managing director and uh, I do interview a lot of developers who are applying for jobs and I work with many developers who work from overseas and uh, because of that I can see uh, some, some similarity of maybe some mistakes that people make when they are looking for a job. Besides that, before joining the company, before joining for other systems, six years ago, I spent maybe 15 years ago or so, no, maybe less actually, like 12 years ago, 12 years, working as an independent consultant. So I was going through lots of technical interviews myself. Also, uh, I wrote or co-wrote a bunch of different books and um, the recent one was Java programming 24-hour training it's right up on top on the right top right corner and uh, the materials of this book no no not this book this presentation uh, you can find in a free uh, downloadable ebook called uh, enterprise software without the BS it's right there it's hidden somewhere up up there so let's do let's go what is this talk about how to look for a job, how to prepare a resume, how to go to an interview, how to accept or reject an offer, what are the cultural differences, that, the way I see them in outsourcing projects, what being a senior Java developer means. Actually, these slides are from Java conference, so that's why I use the word Java, but it's applicable, I believe, uh, for different programming languages. How to work as an employee or a contractor, what's your salary, how to, how to deal with this sensitive subject, and what about keeping uh, your skills up to date? Let's talk about this game called looking for job. I came up with this IPO pattern. These red letters, as you can see, I want to separate three things. The first one, getting the interview. The second one, passing the interview. And the third one, considering the offer. If you get an offer, of course. But I want to stress, and I can't stress well enough that these three tasks that everybody goes through once in a while are to be resolved separately. First of all, getting the interview. You have to prepare a resume, or in some countries they call it CV, but long story short, it's a short description of your skills, qualifications, and projects that you've been working on in the past. First thing is to remember that if you don't get any job interview, there's only one reason. 
well, other than market is absolutely dead and there is no job for anybody. But if there are jobs out there, but you don't get a, an interview, an interview, then your resume doesn't work. There is nothing else. There is no other reason. Tons of resumes are being delivered to different agency headhunters, recruiters. They don't have time to read each of these resumes. The first goal is to sift through the resumes and throw away into the waste most of them, maybe 90% of them. So what's the goal? What's your goal? Your goal is to make sure that your resume will not get into this waste paper basket. How to do that? You have to work with your resume all the time. First of all, it has to be short. After spending 25 years, 25 plus years in IT, my, my resume, as a matter of fact, I don't read resume today, but I still have a resume, which is two page long only two page long. You don't have to write stories about everything that happened to you in the past 15 years. Concentrate, of, concentrate on what is needed for this particular job. Highlight the skills that, you, that your employer needs. Use this top portion of the resume for something useful. Don't write the, the statements like, I am looking for a challenging position that will allow me to fully utilize my talents and potential. It doesn't say anything. I don't have time to read all this BS. You need to give me something that I understand, that I can relate to the opening that our company has. Like, uh, I'm an experienced Java developer, and I know a, a bunch of different, uh, maybe you can list them, uh, frameworks, and I and I am an experienced developer in web applications that utilize messaging, for example. These couple of lines tell me something about you. This is a summary, but not uh, some vague statement that don't tell me anything. So this resume goes right away to the basket. I don't need to know that you've been doing Visual Basic 15 years ago if I'm looking for a Java programmer. So don't do that. I mean, minimize all this ex irrelevant experience. For every job post you are applying to, for every job you are applying to, you have to adjust your resume. I'm not saying that you have to lie on the resume, but you have to highlight the relevant experience and make it stand out, other than just blindly emailing a bunch of the same one and only resume to any position that is out there. So you have to work with your resume all the time. Next, let's say you got, a, got an injury. So the first part is over. The next goal is to pass a technical interview. P to pass a technical interview. How you do this? You can say, I, am, I don't know everything. I'm not as that strong technically. Of course, I want to make sure you understand. If you are... If you are a big shot, big technical shot, and if you do know everything, of course, there is not much uh, that I can offer you as an advice. You, you just know everything, like an Encyclopedia Britannica. But there's not many people who know everything. I'm addressing now mainly younger developers that didn't have a chance to learn everything and to, to talk about any technical subject. So how to increase your chances of passing the technical interview. First of all, uh, I want to remind you or maybe tell you a typical situation how these entry in interviews get arranged. Imagine an enterprise, uh, developers came to work and they, they are minding their own business, they, they work on their own tasks and the manager stopped by and says, uh, John, you know what, we need you to interview somebody, we have a a couple of applicants today that we want you to interview. It's not fun for John. It's not something that he's looking uh, forward to. Uh, there's nothing much to learn during from these interviews. They don't get paid for these for interviewing candidates. So he go there, and uh, the chances are that this person is not a skillful interviewer. In many cases, he is just a developer 
who is maybe technically good, but uh, he doesn't have special skills to interview people. So in some, in many cases, actually, they don't even know what to ask you. So they start going over the resume, asking how you did this, how you did that. So your goal is to make sure that you can show uh, that you are technically sound and that you understand some subject, we some subjects well. And you can say, I don't have anything ch challenging yet. I'm a young developer. I am a 25 years old guy. And my projects that uh, I worked on are not that challenging and exciting to talk about. But you don't have to talk about only those things that you've done while working on the real world projects. You could have researched one or two subjects, like do your homework, pick up some of the challenging, from the technical point of view, topics, research them well, and uh, talk about them during the interview. And you may say, what if they will not ask me about this? What if, for example, if you want to research issues with uh, uh, multi-threading applications in Java, when you work in web applications, or if you want to research an issue with messaging, what are the different ways and what are the problems that you may have and how to in increase the performance. So you can say, what if they will not ask me about these the complex technical subjects. My my message to you is you don't have to depend on what they ask you and what they don't ask you. As I said, typically the guy who will be interviewing you is not very skillful um, interviewer, and uh, when and you always have it have a chance or should be able to switch the subject and talk about what you want to say and talk about the technical top topics that you want to present. Of course, you, may, you, I, you want to make sure that you research the subject really well. The guy who interviews you, who interviewing you will be grateful too. He doesn't need to uh, come up with some uh, questions. He doesn't need to think what to ask next. He can listen to you. And of course, being a more senior uh, developer than you are, he can start asking questions on the subject that you are presenting and uh, you have to be well in there you have to you have you have to know the subject well of course otherwise you're dead in the water i remember back in the 90s i uh, i was working with a colleague and there was something new back then even you work with sql you you we've been able to write queries actually he he learned it first uh, uh, using so-called characteristics functions it's a special technique that would allow to write a SQL query that works much more efficient and fast. Back then, nobody even knew about this technique. I'm, I'm sure that most of you who are listening to me now don't even know about this technique. But back then, definitely, nobody had a chance to ask him this question during interviews. But uh, this person never left any interview without presenting and without talking about this subject. This is something that can show you in a nice light and highlight your skills. And again, you have to be good. You have to be uh, well researched in this subject. By the way, mm, when, I, uh, when I was presenting this talk, this topic uh, last week in Ukraine, uh, this topic this, this presentation went really well and people were grateful. I spent an hour talking about it and then half an hour as answering questions. 99% of the feedback was great. But there was maybe one or two people who said that I was teaching people to lie on the interview. What's lie? If, if I am a coach of a football team, does teaching people make some tricks with a ball uh, uh, qualify as lying interviewing is a game and you have to know the rules of the game it's not a fair game many of you probably uh, have bad experience because this game didn't let didn't let you in into the company into, in some cases so knowing the rules of the game and using them to your advantage is very important and I'm not scared or I'm not afraid to say that even though I'm the person who
who might be interview, interviewing you if you will apply for a job in our company. But I am not afraid. I, I respect people who are well researched technically, regardless of if it was prepared talk or if it's something spontaneous. So let's say you, pa you pass the interview, technical interview. Now the next step, by the way, you need to leave you need to leave the building nicely where you are in the company that was interviewing you. I can tell you this story. It's in, it happened in New York maybe 10 years ago, I remember. I was talking to my friend, she is a recruiter, and she told me this story. The guy came in and he did great technically, excellent skills, excellent knowledge. And uh, then he was leaving the... Uh, the floor where the company was and the he stopped by receptionist and he asked where is my coat it was winter time and he he, put, he gave her the coat and she uh, she took him to the closet where all the uh, coats were and uh, she opened up the door and she asked which one is yours and he smiled at her and said mine is the best and he left the building he never got an offer. People don't need assholes, even though they are technically great. So do your job, pass the technical interview, and leave the building quietly. Right after you left the building, stop where you are, take a piece of paper or all these smartphones which have notepads, and immediately type in or write down whatever you did wrong. You know better than anyone that there, is a, there was a question during this interview that you didn't do really well. So write it down, not later, now. And then go home, research the subject and figure out what you did wrong. And so the next time you are not repeating this mistake. So now you're back home. And even if you will get an offer right there on the spot during the technical interview, don't accept the offer. Go home. Say, I'll think about it. And so, see, there is a separate stage considering the offer. You, you have plenty of time. You have, to, you have time to think about it. If you don't like it, say, I don't like it. If you like it, accept the offer. But um, uh, my point is, play the game by the rules, separate these three stages, and if you came to an interview, it means to a company, it means that you do want this position. Don't, get, don't do me a favor saying that, like behaving like a prima donna, saying that mm, I might consider working for your company. I'll think about it. If you are applying for a job, if you're answering the ad that I posted, I assume that you want this job. So behave professionally, accordingly uh, to the situations. Don't give me, don't do me a favor. I'll find someone else if you don't want it, but be nice. Your first job. This is mainly for young kids who are right out of college and they're thinking where to go, which one is the best employer and what is the best salary for yourself. Your salary, to be honest with you, your first salary doesn't matter. So who is your first employer, doesn't matter, really. I mean, of course, if you, everybody wants to work for Google, that's given. But uh, not everybody can work for Google. So, and you, you don't know at this point when you're out of college what exactly that you want to do in your career. So get a decent company, get an offer, and look around. Think about what do you want to do in life. Not, everybody's, not everybody is a good fit for being a programmer, a coder, a software developer. Maybe you will figure out that you want to move uh, toward management or maybe toward business analysis or maybe you want to become a database administrator or any other profession that exists in IT. What your goal is for the first year to learn how to work in a team, how to communicate with other people in your team. Uh, what the other goal is, how to talk to 
uh, business users. You need to learn how to talk to them. So life in IT is not just about putting the, uh, the headphones from your iPod and just typing in the if statements. You have to turn it off periodically and talk to people. You need to learn how to talk to people. You need to learn how to manage your time. So if, you, if your manager gives you an assignment, an assignment has to be done in five days, in, it has to be done in five days. You, you shouldn't be carried away by something else that you believe is great or more interesting. You have to man, learn how to manage your time. You have to deliver what's expected. Don't try to, to do better than you're asked to. If a manager gives you an assignment, give what he wants or she wants. In many cases, people are trying to do better, to give more, and they, did, they couldn't estimate the effort, and because, because of that, the deadlines are missed. So all these are the questions that you have to ask yourself during the first year in your career in, in IT. And uh, so where is, what is your first employer is not really, it doesn't really matter. But what does matter, or the best place to work is a, a team where everybody is smarter than you, which is an easy, achievable goal if you are a kid from college. If, you, if everybody is smarter than you, then you have something to learn. You have a lot to learn, actually, from people around you. Don't try to find a place where you are uh, the best uh, uh, in the team. You need to be able to learn from somebody. Let's talk about headhunters and recruiters. Uh, on this slide you see the, the question, what real estate agents and headhunters have in common? When you are buying a house, at least this is how it works in the United States, you hire a, an agent, a real estate agent, and the person who sells the house hires a real estate agent. And sometimes people say that this person works on the buyer's side and the other agent works on the seller's side, representing the interests of the seller. But the truth of the matter is that both of them work for the seller. Both of these agents are interested in closing this deal no matter what because both of them will get commissions if you will purchase that house. The same thing is in IT. If you are applying for jobs, the agents that represent you, the agents and send your resume to a client is very interested in you taking this position to close the deal. So he always, or in most cases, he or she plays uh, for the company that is hiring. Regardless of what it is, uh, you have to be nice and friendly with the real estate agents. Never burn bridges with them, with headhunters. We need each other. This is how it works. The whole system works this way. You may like it, you may not like it, but we live in a very small world. Even here in New York City, it's a huge city with lots and lots of IT openings. In your profession, in your specialization, in your skill level, there is a group of openings, pretty small group of openings at any given time. And a group of agents are mm, trying to deal, trying to fit or fill this position. And if you will burn the bridges and you, if you will behave not nicely, not professionally with any uh, recruiter, it will get, get back to you. So don't do this. Be nice. Be friendly. They may need you. We need each other. Next, I'll talk about uh, are you a senior developer or not? Again, this talk was presented for Java developers, and in particular it was in Ukraine, and in Ukraine they have this special uh, system of giving titles. They give uh, titles to young kids, so you can, it's, you can easily find somebody who is 25 years old, and the title reads that senior Java developer. So who is a senior Java developer? By the way, they do this over there just to, to give uh, some pride maybe to young kids, to show them the career letter, to have a chance, to give them a chance to get promoted by giving these titles. So the question is, are you a senior Java developer? 
some of the questions that I've heard. Yes, because I'm already 25 and work with Java for five years. Wrong. Another, another answer. Yes, I'm senior. Look at the title of my business card. Wrong. Uh, yes, I'm senior because we have 20 Java developers in our company and everybody comes to me for help. Wrong. So what I want to see, what I want to see, no, what I call or when I can say that you are a senior Java developer. For example, if I ask you a question, why your project is built on a particular framework, say on Struts framework or Spring framework or using Hibernate, a typical question that I'm hearing is, when I joined the project, this framework was already in place. So if you are a senior programmer, you have to have an opinion. You have to answer something different. You can say, when I joined the project, uh, the project was uh, using Struts framework. In my opinion, it would be better that if we would use Spring Framework for this and this and this reason. But it, did, it didn't depend on me much. Uh, that's why well, I, I kept working with this framework. So now it's a different story. Now you're not just saying I used what I was given. To. You can say that you can express your opinion. Or if I ask you, can you compare using HTTP versus sockets or web sockets? These days, HTML5 web sockets is a really great thing. Do you have an opinion? If yes, compare. Then I can see that you are maybe a senior uh, Java developer or a person who, is, who cares about the technology. Or this thing, uh, if I ask you would, you, would introducing messaging benefit your project? Do you have an opinion? Do you know what I'm talking about? Or can you work on assignment without supervision? In, in my opinion, the easy way to see who is a junior developer is by the level of noise this person generates. If you see a person uh, in a group who always is complaining about something, somebody didn't give him something, the software is not there, the IDs are not there, the tables were not created in the database, or stuff like that, this is a sign that you're dealing with a junior developer. Senior developers, they find solutions. They don't just make noise about pro problems, but they find solutions to these problems. What I like, uh, the other definition that I like, I read recently an interview with Doug Crockford. He's a pretty well-known person, an experienced person, of course, in the JavaScript uh, domain. And somebody asked him, uh, I don't remember the wording, but the, somebody asked him, what is a feature or, or typical feature of any junior developer? And he answered, lack of curiosity. In my opinion, it's a very good answer. Lack of curiosity. If you don't care, you can't be senior. You can put anything on your business card, but you are not a senior developer. You have to care. So basically, are you a problem or you are a solution? If you are a solution, you are a senior. If you generate problems to your manager, you are not. Next. Something strange that I've heard from people from Ukraine. When I interview them over the phone, uh, and if I ask a question, why are you looking for a job? These are some of the weird answers that I got. The first one. I don't really need money. I own an apartment and rent it out. Uh, my congratulations to you, of course, if you rent an apartment. But why, why, do you, why do you want to work for me? If you don't care, if you don't need money, what is your motivation? Just pick up the rent and enjoy your life. I don't need you, even if you, your technical skills are good. Another answer I get. I like my job, but just want to see what's available. Again, why are, why are you wasting my time? If, if you want to learn what's available out there on the market, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to waste my time just showing you what's available in our company. Go somewhere else and talk to someone else. When I hear uh, reasoning like these, I try to 
to finish the interview as soon as possible. It's a waste of time. People don't have motivation at all. The other one I, yeah, I've heard, it's, which is a good one, I think, uh, the guy from Kiev told me, uh, when I said, uh, why are you looking for a job? He said, our client is in London, and the VPN connection is very slow. This VPN connection made him unhappy. Is this a motivation to, f to switch jobs? The VPN connection may be fixed. If you have a nice job, stay, stick to it. You can expect everything to be great. Everything comes as a package. Well, in this particular case, the VPN connection is low. But what if the, uh, the project was uh, very interesting? So it's not a good reason. For some reason, people uh, from uh, India, people from Eastern Europe, they are afraid to say simply that they need more money. That's why I'm looking for a job. Here in America, it's, it's a normal, honest question, which I can understand. Especially when, when, we, talk, when we talk about uh, contractors. But this is a good reason. Everybody wants more money. Don't be afraid to state this. You're looking for a job because you want to make more money. But the next question is, is this the only way to get more money? Do you have to switch jobs to get more money? Mm, uh, to be honest with you, no. But let's, uh, uh, let's take it one step at a time. First of all, when to look for a job. Uh, you need to look for a job when the sun is bright and the grass is green. Not when they kick you out already for something or may maybe the, when they lay off already there. Again, I'm not talking about the situation when you get some severance package. But look for a job when everything is fine. I'm not saying that you have to switch job, but you, at least this will give you a chance to evaluate your skills, to see how good you are according to the current market requirements. Just making a couple of bucks a month is not a good reason for switching job. But learning new technologies and uh, having better growth opportunities can be a reason for a move. And is quitting the only way to get raised? Can this stupid boss understand that I may leave soon? Why he doesn't give me a raise? Why he doesn't give me more money? How to ask for a raise? Uh, to ask for a raise, you have to talk to your manager and you have to say something like this. I'm not talking about uh, this conversation happening after you got an offer from someone else. No, even before going anywhere. Say you have, uh, you're getting X amount of money and you want X plus N. So what you need to do, you need to stop by and ask your manager, can you please tell me what's my career path? What do I need to do for the company, for the project? What extra responsibility do I need to take to earn so much or to get this title? If you talk like this, your manager will understand that you are, that you care, that you want to grow and maybe they will find a job or maybe not the job, the, the other project. Maybe if he had a project that he couldn't fill, that he couldn't find a person for, maybe you are a great fit. Maybe he will give you a chance to, uh, to go up a little bit in the corporate, corporate letter. So give him a chance. And if the person will answer you, for example, no, you know what, there's no way for me to raise you, I pay you as much as I can, then it's a different story. Then you can go out and try to find something better. But maybe you don't have to leave. Maybe this company, which has great uh, uh, setup, excellent colleagues, and you feel comfortable in the company, don't leave. Give a chance to your manager. Maybe they can give you a raise without quitting. But what if you decided to quit anyway, to resign? What are the rules of resignation? First of all, don't just resign because you're angry with your boss. Today you're angry, tomorrow you're not. It's not a reason to make this, uh, to jump into a conclusion and to, to, to shut the door with a bang. Next, 
Give, always give an advance notice, verbally and in writing. You spend so much time with this company and uh, don't they deserve um, some advance notice? You've been working on a piece of software and you don't know, maybe they need some time to, um, for knowledge transfer to, to prepare another person in the team so they can pick your responsibilities. So give them verbally and, give them, and send them an email as well. Next, uh, do not accept a counter offer. If, if you give such a surprise, unpleasant surprise to your boss, you've been doing an important part of the uh, project, and all of a sudden you come and uh, say, I'm leaving. And basically you got the, your manager on the spot, and he wasn't prepared for this. Now he need immediately find someone else uh, to pick up your responsibility to learn what you already know. And at this point, he may ask, how much they offer you over there? I will match their offer. And this is, this is called a counter offer. So the rule is do not accept counter offers. If your manager sees that you are leaving, the manager understands that you are looking for a job, that you are not happy for some reason over here, and at this point, he will give you a counter offer, which may be like, a, say, 500 bucks more a month. But immediately, immediately, this person, the manager, will try to find another person who will slowly but surely pick up your knowledge. And then a couple of months down the road, uh, he will say, you know, Joe, we have a situation and uh, we have to lay off some people and you are the one who's losing the job. He will, he will fire you, but when it's more convenient for him, not for you. Uh, you I'm sure you can say there are exceptions, and I, had, I did accept counter offers in the past, and it didn't work this way. Yes, there are exceptions to the rule, but the rule is the rule. Try not to accept counter offer. Also, do not resign until you found another job. Don't go in nowhere look for a job while you have a job and one more do not give advices to your boss on the way out there could be a situation when you are leaving and your boss uh, or maybe HR department will arrange a meeting with your boss and the boss will ask you oh, I know that we are losing you there is nothing we can do about it but maybe you can give an, adv an advice to me what did I do wrong so in the future I will learn from my mistakes and you feel great, oh, now finally you can tell them what you think, how they run, how poorly they run the business or the project. And you start going on and giving advices what has to be changed. And uh, you may insult the manager by doing this. And the manager knows how to run the project and now he understands how you hated him all these uh, years. Maybe not hated, but at least this conversation will not be helpful. Neither for you, nor for the manager. Don't teach the manager how to run the business. He, he runs the way he runs. But a month or six months down the road, you may have come back to the manager for references. And this manager may or may not give you the best reference, depending on what you taught him on the way out. So, leaving... Just leave. Don't be, don't be a smart ass. One, one other thing that is important, do not post negative blogs about the company you quit. You don't like it there, it doesn't make that they are bad. But don't bad mouth the company you quit. Couple of more topics, contractors versus consultants. No, sorry, contractors versus employees, basically. Uh, here in the United States, contractors uh, work, uh, as we call, on W-2 or corp to corp. Sometimes we call corp to corp uh, 1099. W-2 means you work for a company and they withdraw your taxes and you get the net pay. Corp to corp means that you've incorporated yourself, you created a corporation, just met incorporated, and now the company A, for example, Sony, pay, uh, pays the, to the company just made incorporated and just made incorporated pays salary 
to add to the person called Joe Smith, but it's a different entity. What's important is that contractors work for money. Period. There is no other, other reason. That's why they are contractors. They don't have career goals. They don't came. They don't come to your company trying to make a career within your company. In a way, it's a pretty healthy relationship. They came to you. They sell you the expertise, and they easy leaving. Uh, they they leave when the project is over. It's a pretty simple relationship. They don't have career goals. They work for money. They like the hourly rate or daily rate. They work for you. They don't. They don't. There is no hard times for. There is no difficult times for you to get rid of them. The project is over. Sorry. So it's pretty clean. In some cases, there are situations we call try and buy, or contract to hire. That you start as a contractor and then. Mm, and there's an option for them to hire you as an employee if they like. But most contractors, or sometimes they are called consultants, work for clients through a third-party firm. Some of these people are angry. They say, how come I work through them and this middleman, this agency got rich? They take a cut from every hour I work without doing anything. But uh, you need to remember that these uh, agencies earn the right to make some money uh, out of your placement. They spend a lot of energy and resources yeah, and uh, financial resources to make sure that the cl this particular client works with them, that this particular client gives them the job openings uh, rather than someone else. They can serve as an intermediary that pays you money in, on time all the time, while they may have delays in payments from the client. So if you don't like this situation, that you work and somebody get rich, then find a direct contract and, uh, and uh, be happy. Try it. It's so difficult. But if you find it, uh, be happy or maybe you are not so happy and then you will deal on your own with this client if you can't find a direct contract get back to work and get some peace of mind when to be an employee be an employee if you care about the title maybe you want to have this uh, corner office on your floor uh, with a nice plate wooden plate that reads uh, Joe Smith senior director and if it's important for you, and if you are planning to build a career in this company, fine, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. Be, work as an employee. In some cases, some people say, I want to make a difference. If you want to make a difference within the company, you want to change something, work as an employee. In some cases, job interviews may be stressful for you. Work as an employee. You will not need to go that often uh, for an interview. In some cases, you need to have good medical coverage, which, which is very important. It's USA-specific. Not everybody is covered in our country, and um, uh, it's not easy uh, to buy a medical insurance if you have so-called pre-existing condition. If you have some chronic disease, maybe the insurance company won't sell you a decent insurance. So it could be uh, an important reason on its own having good medical coverage for some people. Some people uh, are happy having a ping pong table in the office so they can play ping pong. It's like a Google style of perk. If this is important for you to have a ping pong table, that's fine. Then find a place, find the employers with a ping pong table and be happy. Maybe you are an employee, but uh, one of the first employees in a startup company. It's a different story. Of course, you want to be an employee in that case. Or maybe your spouse already works as a contractor. Having two contracts in the same two contractors in the same family may be a little bit too much. So then work as an employee, one of you. Be an, be a contractor when or if. If you don't care about your title, you just need cash. Long and green, that's what you need. 
uh, maybe you like to have a chance to work with different technologies. You like to switch. Go ahead, work as a contractor. Maybe you like learning new stuff quickly and keeping your skills sharp and up to date in the, in the various uh, technologies. Work as a contractor. Maybe you hate corporate politics. Work as a contractor. Uh, working as a contractor in this regard is pretty clear-cut. It's very healthy relations. The manager you work for understands that your goal is not to replace him. Your goal is not to make any career in this company. So it's pretty easy, easy way of working on a project. And of course, if you are reasonably healthy, coming back to that thing with uh, insurance coverage, if your spouse has a good coverage, then you're you're covered. But if not, and you have to be reasonably healthy. What's the main goal of a professional IT contractor? Let's consider this case. I had this situation uh, recently. Say uh, Peter. Say the manager tells a uh, contractor, Peter, XYZ is a library of good-looking UI components. Please use it in our web application. This is what the manager says. Peter, being good technical, technically sound person, seasoned developer, says, uh, he, he doesn't say anything, but he knows for sure that using this particular UI library will or may slow down the development, and um, it has some bugs. So how do we react? What do you say to that? You need to, in my opinion, again, this is my opinion only, what I was uh, doing all these years when I had the situation like this, while working as an independent contractor, I was always giving honest technical opinion. I would, I would have said that XYZ is a great looking, uh, library of great looking components, but it has so and so and so and so. It has these problems. And I believe that it's not a great choice. I would say this once. But keep in mind that your manager may have the whole bunch of different reasons why mm, not using this library. Maybe there is a company policy that we, you have to stick to another library. Maybe you already purchased some other library and you have to use the licensing uh, that you already, licenses that you already have. There could be anything. So tell your technical opinion once, but if the manager insists, don't fight with the manager. You are a contractor. So give technical, technically honest opinion and then accept what they say. Look at this, uh, the bodyguard slide. Remember Kevin Costner and Whitney Houston? Kevin Costner was a bodyguard. The main goal of Kevin Costner was to protect this singer. So this is exactly what we have in our field. If you're a contractor, if somebody hired you, your main goal is to make the hiring manager happy and successful and to make sure that the project goes well. That's the only reason. That's the only goal actually for you. So have this, go into the state of mind and make the manager happy. Of course, be uh, give uh, sound technical advices as well. While comparing incomes of em employees and contractors, remember one thing. Contractors don't get any benefits. I put this slide only it's a specific of Ukraine because they call themselves uh, contractors, but still their employee gives them holidays, uh, membership to gyms and stuff like this. In our country, in the United States, contractors don't get any benefit. They are not employee. No paid holidays, vacations, sick days, trainings, no gym membership, no massage parlors, nothing. You work an hour, you get paid for an hour. Or you work a day, you get paid by a day. That's it. The conflict that I see between the uh, American employer and offshore developer, and this is something... Uh, because of not because of English basically because of, because of different cultures and misunderstanding the thing is that uh, typically professionals in the United States are very polite when they talk they don't they don't want to put you down 
even if they if they don't like something that you've done they will not scream at you they will not shout at you they will try to make sure that your self esteem is not hurt but this can be understood in the wrong way in some other countries so for example the american team lead john says to remote developer peter Peter, I like the way you program classes, employee, and contractor whose methods increase salary and increase rate. You could have done it a little bit different uh, by introducing the interface payable with one generic method, increase pay. This is what the John said to Peter. Peter thinks to himself, John likes my solution. There are so many different ways of achieving the same results in Java. It's time to work on the next, assi next assignment. And what John really meant to say. Peter is clearly a junior and uh, he has no clue about designing two interfaces. If he won't fiz fix the, his John code, I'll replace him. Maybe it's a little bit extreme, but see, different understanding, miscommunication because of English, because of not understanding the culture of Americans in this case. So don't afraid to ask questions. So in this case, what Peter should have done, Peter should have said, John, do you want me to, to change it, to, to, to rewrite it, to refactor the code? Don't be scared. Make sure that there is no misunderstanding. Don't assume that what you understand is what uh, John meant to say. It'll save you some grief. Presenting yourself online. This is also an unusual thing. I've never seen anything like this in the United States. At some point I had to find a freelancer in a Russian a freelancer site. And I was looking for a person who knows Java and Spring Framework. I did this search in freelancer.ru and this is what I've got. How do you like this developer, junior Java developer? Of course I would love to hire such a person. I am not sure uh, though if I would uh, be working on Java and Spring, this, this, this would be my main focus. But what kind of presentation is this? What is that for? So be reasonable when you present yourself online. Find a better headshot that is appropriate for professional developers. This is another thing that is specific to Eastern Europe. For some reason, or maybe not for some reason, I guess they have age discrimination. But many of them, of the employer, assume that after 35 years old, software developers are brain dead. This is not the case here in, in the United States. And when I see, when I get a resume that starts with the date of birth, I understand that I came from the Eastern European country. Guys, don't be afraid if you're 35, even 37, even 45, even 54. You still can be a great programmer, a great software developer. So don't be afraid. Don't put your age in front of the page. And finally, I want to cover this sensitive subject, what's your salary? This is basically the most confidential and sensitive information in the United States, which is not the case in some countries. In some countries, people casually say, I make so much and I make so much. And in those countries, it's not considered to be a wrong question asking how much you make. But uh, in my opinion, it's wrong to advertise your salary to each and every person you know. Do not tell anybody who uh, do not tell anybody how much you make. Don't ask them how much they make. People who are entitled to know this number, they already know. Only your boss, HR, and sometimes your spouse know this secret number. That's enough. There is no benefits of telling other people your salary and i'll go through several use cases the use case number one for example at a corporate party vlad says to peter i got a ten thousand dollar bonus peter says they work together by the way peter says wow that's so cool 
That's what Peter said. And they don't go for beer anymore. They used to work on the same project, and uh, Peter didn't get bonus. Well, Vlad did. We don't know what happened from the manager's point of view. But, see, the, this knowledge didn't help to anyone in this case. In another case, two former colleagues, college mates actually, they used to live together in the dorm and they are the family party after college for so many years. Vlad spent three years working on his PhD after master degree. While Peter all these years spent he spent all these years working for an offshore company and he revealed that his thousand is three thousand dollars. Again, this is specific to Ukraine, but the number it doesn't matter. Much more than what uh, PhD makes at this point. Vlad got divorced three months later. They used to be with families, with wives, and then they came home and uh, Vlad's wife said, how come Peter was always behind and you've been genius all these years and now what do we have? Now I see that uh, people who are stupid they make more more money than you so they got divorced so this knowledge didn't help in this case either use case number three Masha she's a team lead and superstar developer Peter literally programmed the entire project himself and all of a sudden Peter found out that uh, Masha was making more money than him he's pissed off how come he's a man he is dumb man. He made the whole thing happening. But he didn't know that without Masha, they wouldn't even get this project in the first place and he would have to look for a job. So don't say how much who you make and don't ask. Don't ask, don't tell that the policy when it comes to salary. Another case, Alex found out that his teammate Peter is making more. And during annual review, Alex said, why Peter is making more? I have a lot more job experience than Peter. So the manager promised to look into this. And Alex was laid off two weeks later. Why? Because it's a bad egg in the company, in the team. The manager doesn't want all these commotions and doesn't want to have unhappy people who are discussing money. It's none of your business. Now you're making say three three thousand a month. A job ad offers from three and a half to four thousand a month. So you need to understand that uh, whoever offers you the job, the potential employer wants you to accept three and a half k. While you look at these numbers and you want to get four k. So you look at these two at this range differently from different size so to speak so basically there is a rule that the first person to mention the number loses you when they ask you how much you make or how much you want uh, ideally you should say that you are open to any fair offer because the compensation the, the the salary is not the only uh, the only reason you work there the whole package may consist of salary. Maybe they pay for your college education. Maybe the, you, you have great vacation. Maybe you have a chance to travel to Europe uh, on business. So say that and insist that you will be ex uh, considering any offer. Go home, wait for an offer, then think about it. You'll, you like it, take it. You don't like it, reject it. And finally, you have to keep your skills up to date. Keeping your technical skills current is very important. It's your job security. I don't think there, 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 there ever will be a situation when they mm, fire everybody, right? Let's say they will fire half of the developers, software developers. Then, then make sure that your technical skills are in the higher 50% uh, of the developers crowd. Uh, go to training, subscribe, to, uh, enroll into training classes which you found. Don't uh, accept uh, the fact that this company works with this particular training provider and that's all you have to do. Find the right training class for you, 
and talk to your manager and say, I know that we work with an XYZ training provider, but this is a really training class that I want to, to, to take. What are you, you going to lose? They will not send you to this class? Fine, so they will say so. Who is teaching is more important than what is being taught. The personality, the technical skills, the ability to teach is important. Is really important. These days you can see many trainers online, they speak, they publish on YouTube, they, they uh, record audio podcasts. So find the one that you like and trust and try to get into this person's class. Technical conferences is uh, important. Attend them and do not ignore expo floors. When you go uh, and see all these people standing by the booth, they are technically they are technical developers who research their subject really well. They, yes, they, they are there to sell their product, but they are bored while standing on the expo floor. And they will be more than happy to talk to a technical person about technical subject. So what? Yes, you're going to leave, you're going to drop the, your business card in the, into that uh, jar. And they might be calling you sometime later, or their salesman will, or their recruiter will. But meanwhile, you can find and have you can find answer to your technical questions, and you can have a really great technical conversation with the vendor. So talk to them. Don't be afraid. Talk to them, and you'll enjoy the conversation. So that's about all I wanted to say today. And you can download legally. You can download legally two of my uh, e-books. These are for free, and. Um, one of them is called Enterprise Software Without the BS, which I wrote back in 2008, and maybe I will write in it some extra, um, so many chapters to this book soon, but it's a free download, so the, the subject of this talk was described in greater details over there. Besides that, I have another ebook called Programming for Kids, Parents, and Grandparents. It's existence three versions. Uh, the Russian one is the latest one, of course, but there is also an English and French versions that are available for free um, download, and you can easily find them. And uh, where to find them, go to my blog, yakofain.com, and there are publications, and you can find all these links. Uh, you can uh, visit uh, our corporate blog, which is mainly technical. You can send me an email, you can uh, send me a tweet, and you can listen to podcasts in English or Russian, whatever you understand, and enjoy. So thank you very much for coming. This was Yakov Fein with his opinion on how to become a professional software developer, a professional enterprise, let's say, software developer. Thank you.